1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. Turn that down just a little bit, Brandon. I like to be loud, but I don't like to be that loud, all right? 1 <clears throat> Samuel chapter 17 tonight. 1 Samuel 17. Again, I hope that you grabbed a handout so you can follow along in the lesson tonight. Tonight we're in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and I want you to notice with me verse 10. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 10. This is one of the most iconic, most famous passages in all of the Bible. Probably one of my favorite passages, probably one of your most favorite passages. If, if I could get, you say, Pastor, if you could get in a time machine and you could go and travel back in time and, and pick one or two, uh, several places or several times, can I say this would be one of those times I would want to sit on a hillside and I would want to see this happen and I would want to see the Goliath fall and I would hear the, want to hear the thud of him and see the dust roll out from under his, uh, under his fall and uh, I think that would be absolutely thrilling. But notice with me in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 10, and the Philistine said, I, read that next word with me, defy. The armies of Israel this day, give me a man that we may fight together. Of course, this is Goliath, and Goliath is issuing a challenge. He'd been challenging them 40 days and 40 nights to give him a man to fight. Then I want to preach a message, Goliath must fall. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this evening. We thank you, Father, for the wonderful, amazing, tremendous things, Lord, that have been recorded in the pages of your word. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for the wonderful tr uh, truths and lessons, Lord, God, that have been gleaned and grown and, and God understood from this wonderful passage. Father, we pray tonight that our faith would be instructed. God, I pray, Lord, that our confidence in you would grow. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, tonight in Jesus' name. And amen. You know, one of the wonderful things that I love about the Bible is it's full of the wonderful good, amazing, great things God does. Can I just say, God does great things. If you, take, take this reference down, write this reference, Psalm 77 verse 14. The Bible says, thou art God, thou art the God that doest wonders, thou hast declared thy strength among the people. Psalm 136 verse 4 says this, to him who alone doeth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. Can I, just, can I just say this tonight? We serve an amazing God. Would anybody say amen to that? We serve an amazing God. We serve a God who does amazing things. And my friend, there's a reason why God puts these truths, these passages in the Bible for our faith to be informed and our faith to be instructed. And tonight, listen, this isn't just a children's story. This is a Bible truth. This truth is not in here for children to learn a, a story or, or, or fill out a cuddling sheet. Listen, this event, this, this chronicle was put down so that you and I will know uh, that, that there is a God in heaven who does wonderful things. Let me, just, let me just ask this tonight. How many of you have faced some real challenges in your life? Would you raise your hand? You have faced some real challenges. All of us have. Let, let me just make a few introductory statements tonight. You say, Pastor, why do we, as, as an, a group of adults and young adults, why, why is it important to learn this passage? Well, I'll tell you this. Number one, can I say this? Life is full of challenges. Now, this isn't in your notes. I couldn't fit it on that little half page, all right? Life is full of challenges. Number two, can I just say this? This sinful world is full of enemies. This sinful world is full of enemies. My friend, as I think of our children... I think of the young children who go to school. I think of our teenagers. Can I say, they face challenges. They face giant struggles today. You think of what the, uh, the government, you think of what the CDC, you think of what the education department is trying to put into the, the, the morals they're trying to put into them. The, the, the things, the social norms that they're trying to inform them of. My friend, you, when you think, you send your teenager, your child to, to, to school my friend, they are facing a giant of opposition. I, I, my heart grieves how many of these stories we hear of, of, of children and, and young people being mercilessly bullied in schools. And the, 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 the emotional, the, the mental, the duress. Can I say there are, there are giants in this world today that all of us face. My friend, giants will never cease to be. Until we get to be in glory. What a wonder, how many of you guys think it's going to be wonderful to be in heaven? I think it's going to be wonderful to be in heaven. 
But until we get to the sweet by and by, listen, we have to learn how to live in the nasty now and now. And my friend, you and I are going to face challenges and there's going to be some giant struggles in your life. There's health struggles. There's relationship struggles. There's financial struggles. Listen, there's emotional. There's, uh, there is every type societal struggles. My friends, there's going to be giants in your life. This isn't just a, a, a story about violence. This, this just isn't just a, a story about a little kid, who, a teenager who takes down a big guy. There's a greater purpose. There's a greater principle here. Listen, you face struggles. I face struggles. There are giants, listen my friend, that you will face in this life. And we need to know, listen, that there is a God in heaven who can help. There is a God in heaven who can help. Now, this is interesting. This is just kind of an aside. This is free. This is a little extra tidbit for coming on, on Wednesday night. Now, in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, Jesus made an interesting statement. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out the mouth of God. Now, how many of you believe Jesus tells the truth? If you believe Jesus tells the truth, every word of God is important. Do you know this is an interesting fact as I studied this passage tonight? That in all of the Bible, you say, well, how big is the Bible? Well, the Bible has 66 books, all right? You can write some of these facts down on the side of your, your note card. You'll find this interesting. 66 books of the Bible, your Bible, broken down into 1,189 chapters. 1,189 chapters. By the way, if you read about three of those chapters a day, you'll get through the whole Bible in a year. Those 66 books broken down into 1,189 chapters has 31,102 verses in your King James Bible. By the way, your King James Bible. The Bible we use here for doctrinal reasons, for practical reasons, theological reasons. That's why we use. It's not just the fact that we're old-fashioned, we're stuck in the mud. My friend, there are, there are biblical reasons, theological reasons, and very practical reasons we use that. And here's one of them. I'll take you back to Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So I was just curious. Now it's interesting. And you say, where are you going with this preacher? I'll, I'll get there in a minute. So I said, well, how many words are in my Bible? There are 788,280 words. No, I did not count them. Google did. All right. Thank God for Google. All right. Uh, I had Google count them. 788,280 words in your King James Bible. 66 books, 189 chapters, 31,102 verses, 788,280 words in your King James Bible. And can I say this? This is the only place in the Bible that this event is recorded. This is the only chapter, these are the only verses that record this historic event. I ask you, my friend, you think about this. What would David be without Goliath? His life would be certainly different. What would the Bible be without the event? And I, 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 I pale to use, I hate to use the word story, because I think it, it puts that connotation of a bedtime story, a kiddie story. Listen, my friend, these aren't just stories. These aren't just fables. These are actual, factual, historic events recorded by the Almighty God, inspired, perfectly recorded. All right? Now, this is the only place in your Bible that this event is recorded. Can I just say this? Every word counts. Every verse counts. Every chapter counts. Because my friend, you think, if this chapter was missing from the Bible, you think of how different the life of David would be. You think of how different the history of Israel would be. You think of how different, uh, the, 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 how many times the, the, that these great truths have been preached to us out of one chapter. So I got curious. I, I got curious. Well, what about, what about some other Bibles? So I looked up some of the most popular ones. Uh, would you happen to know, uh, it's interesting, that the NIV has 726,109 words in it. And I did the math, that's 62,170 words less. 62,000 words less. That's a lot of words. That's a whole lot of words. That's a couple books of the Bible. Uh, the second most popular version today is the ESV. It has 7, 700, 757,439 words. That's 30,841 words less than the King James Bible. My friends, that's a lot of words. Now listen, we may quibble about a 1 or 2 or 5 or 10 or 16 or 17 or maybe, hey, out of 788,000, what's 100 words between friends? 
But I'll tell you this, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by how many words? Every. every. So I want an every word Bible. I want a Bible with all the words. So you say, Pastor, why do you stick with that old King James Bible that's hard to read and you got to look up words and, uh, and spend some time figuring out? Because every word matters. That's why. It's one of the very, very many important reasons why. And my friends, this is the only place in the whole Bible where this passage is recorded. By the way, just an interesting fact, in case you feel like, like, you're, like, you're, like you, you're, you're in the vast minority. Statista, all right, that's the actual statista, uh, and I, in fact, I can send you the email, did a survey last year of the American public at large, and they said, if you read the Bible, what Bible did you, do you read on a daily basis? This was last year, my friends. This wasn't 60 years ago, 1970, 1988, last year. The number one Bible read in the United States of America, 31% of people who read a Bible on any regular occasion said they read the King James Bible. Double the next translation of the Bible, double percentage. More than any other Bible still read every day. Don't let them tell you your Bible is out of date, it's antiquated, or it needs to be replaced. My friends, you are in the vast majority not the minority. Now let's get on to the lesson this evening. Those are just a little aside there. The first thing you want to write in your Bible is the Valley of Elah. E-L-A-H. Go back with me to 1 Samuel 17 and verse 1. Uh, so your brother Brandon, if you'll bring up the, uh, the map here. Uh, always love pictures with the lesson. And now, uh, if you'll notice the, the red box here, I think I've got my little pointer on. Hopefully it works this week. This right here uh, is the area of the Valley of Elah. Right here is the land of the Philistines, where Goliath comes from. All of here is the land of Israel. Now, Brother Brandon, hit the next slide, going a little bit farther. We're going to zoom into that red box there, right into that red box here. You can see that Goliath, uh, he was born in the area, uh, in the city of Gath. And the Valley of Elah was right here next to the city of Gath. And Brother Brandon, go to the next slide, if you will, please. This is the last slide. You say, what does the Valley of Elah look like? Well, there was a large hill on one side and a large hill on the other side. And there was a big, very flat plain in the middle. This was not a historical uh, picture. This is one that Google Earth gave us. All right. Now, go back with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 1. The valley, where did this Bible uh, event happen? Now, the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko which belongeth to Judah. It was over in the land of Israel. And pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephas Damim. All right? That one took a long time to practice, folks. All right? Ephas Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together. Notice here. And pitched by the valley of where? The valley of Elah. And set the battle in array armed against the Philistines. Notice here. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side. And Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. Brother Brandon, if you want to bring that last slide back up, sir, you can notice here. So you can picture in your mind, you can picture in your mind the armies of Israel over here on the one side, probably on the western side or the eastern side, the valley of the, Phil the Philistines gathered on the uh, mountain on the western side. And they, uh, the armies descended down to this very large flat plain, and that's where the battle was joined. Now, my friends, whenever God gives us Bible geography it's for a point there's a purpose God just wasn't taking up room adding to the word count giving you something to read every morning with your coffee there's a purpose and a point for this God is pointing out to you where these things happen and so where God mentions Bible geography take your note take your hand and and you go back to your Bible maps and find out where these things handed there's a purpose there now number two the second thing we see about in our events here is the champion Goliath of Gath Goliath of Gath. Notice, pick up our reading in verse 4. There went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath. Goliath was his name. Gath was the city he was from, whose height was six cubits and a span. I want everybody to work with me tonight. I mean, hold up your hand. Doesn't matter which hand it is. Hold up your arm. Touch your elbow. All right, touch your elbow. All right, touch the top of your middle finger. All right, that's, that's a cubit. Uh, the average adult person has a, has a cubit of about 18 inches. A cubit is from the elbow to the top of your middle finger. Now, everybody, uh, everybody go like this. All right, we're all going to Hawaii. We're going to hang loose. All right, we're going to eat some nice sushi. All right, that is a span. 
That is a span between the top of your uh, uh, thumb and the top of your pinky. In a Bible reference, that's a span. So he was, look at that, the Bible says here, he was nine, I believe he said, uh, um, is it, uh, whose height was six cubits and a span. If you add all that up, it's about nine feet, a little over nine feet. I believe that some folks uh, say he was nine feet, six inches. Now, the Bible says he was a champion. You know what that means? I mean, it means he was undefeated. It means he was undefeated. From the time that Goliath went into active service for the Philippines army, he had never been defeated. Every man that he had ever fought, he was victorious and most likely victorious to the death. That's what it meant to be a champion. The Bible says here, there went out a champion of the, out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. Notice his armament. And he had a helmet of brass on his head. And he was armed with a coat of mail. That's chain link mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. About 156 pounds of body armor. All right? Quite a bit. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs. I mean, he had, uh, he had leg coverings. And a target of brass between his shoulders. He had a back plate to keep him from arrows. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. We would say like a four by four. It was about 15 feet tall. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. It's about 15 pound uh, iron tipped spear. Uh, and one bearing a shield went before him. Notice here, and he stood and cried to the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye the servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. And if ye be able to fight with me, and to kill me, and we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him, and kill him, then shall ye be our servants, and serve us. You notice here this, uh, this champion, the Goliath of Gath. Now he continued to taunt, and curse, and, and, and spit and show off for 40 days and 40 nights. Now we enter in. Now we enter in the most unlikely of heroes. Go down with me to verse 12. And we enter David, the delivery boy. We're going to move quickly through some of this preliminary material. This is a 58 chapter, uh, 58 verse chapter. We could probably spend almost a month here if we wanted to. Uh, but we're going to get to the primary message down towards the end of the chapter. We're going to move to some of this introductory material. Look at David, the delivery boy. Now in verse 12, David was the son of that Ephrathite uh, of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons. That means Jesse had eight other sons uh, or seven other sons. David was one of them. And he went for, uh, among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went to follow Saul to the battle. And the names of his three elder, uh, elder sons that went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him, uh, Ahinaab, and the third, Shammah. Notice with me in verse 14, and David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. How many of you were the last, how many of you were the caboose in your home? You were the youngest kid, all right? There's something about being that youngest kid, my friend. Nobody looks up to you. Nobody respects you. Everybody just expects that you're a spoiled brat. David was the youngest of eight, seven other boys, and at least a couple of, uh, of sisters in there. He was the runt. He was the little kid, and nobody thought much of him. You say, how do you know that? Notice with me in verse 15. But David went and returned from Saul. He had gone and played his uh, harp. And, but the, he returned to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And then we go back to the narrative. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. Now we notice here uh, David. And look at verse 17. And Jesse said unto David his son, Now take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn. An ephah is like a basket, all right? He was taking them some provision. And these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousands, and look now to the, uh, look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Their pledge was their grocery order that David was to go in. He had to carry some uh, long-term supplies. He had to take in ten loaves of bread. He had to take these che cheeses, and he was to go deliver them. His job was simply the grocery delivery boy. And when he got there, he's like, oh, what do you need? What do you need from mom? What do you need from dad? What can we get you from home? That was his all that he was supposed to do. That was the uh, simplicity of his responsibility. Now listen, my friend. I want to make a point here. 
many people would consider this to be a waste of a great man. Here's a young man who had already had the opportunity, a glimmer of hope. He had been ushered into the presence of Saul. He was a cunning player on an instrument. He was known as a young man of valor. But then he got sidelined. He was on track to be something and somebody, and all of a sudden there was a, a, a quick left turn in his life, and now he's just, he's in the middle of nowhere. Nobody knows him, nobody cares about him. He's got a few little sheep, nothing's going on. And he is forgotten. In fact, the only thing given the responsibility to David was to take the grocery delivery. Nobody thought much of David, including his family. But listen, my friend, those, the, that divine detour was God's providence. God was preparing, listen, God was preparing that man, that young man, for a bigger task. Please understand, when God gives you a little task, it is so that you will learn faithfulness. It is so you'll learn diligence. It is so that you'll learn faith. It is so you'll learn faithfulness. It is so that God can prove you and show himself to be good and big and mighty and strong. And we're going to learn that in just a minute. Now, go down with me just a few more verses to verse 23. Is there not a cause? David is now here. He's delivering the groceries. We'll pick up our reading in verse 23. And as he talked with them, David is talking with his brothers. Behold, there came out the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. First time, David's here. He's checking it out all out, the, the chaos of the battle and the things that are going on. And he hears and he sees this giant for the very first time. And the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he to come up. To defy means this. He is to come up to prove them to be weak, to prove them to be nothing, to prove that their God is nothing, to prove that there was not a champion among them. That's what it means to defy them. Surely to defy Israel is to come up. Now notice, and it shall be that the man that killeth him, first of all, the king will enrich him with great riches. Number two, and will give him his daughter. And number three, make his father's house free in Israel. That means tax free. How many of you would like to pay no income tax for the rest of your life? Not have to give up 15, 20, 30 percent of your income for the rest of your life. That's a pretty sweet deal right there, all right? Now notice with me, and David spake uh, in verse 26, and David spake to the men that stood by him saying, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Phil Philistine? And taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy, listen, the armies of Saul? Is that what he said? The armies of Israel, is that what he said? No, he said, defy the armies of the living God. You see, David had connected into a truth. Listen, David wasn't serving Saul. David wasn't serving nationalism. David was serving God. That's what made David a great young man. Listen, my friend, one of the greatest truths we can put into the heart of young men is to learn to love God and serve God with all of your heart. Now notice with me the disrespect he got. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard that he spake to these men. And Eliab's anger was kindled, greatly was kindled against David. He said, why camest thou hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Now notice with me a great response, a truly faithful and insightful response. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? David recognized, listen, there was a greater cause than just this big guy in a lot of armor. There was a greater purpose to this battle and to life, listen, than just getting rich and getting married and getting free. David's cause was not the cause of his personal enrichment. David's cause was the glorious name of the honor of his God. That's what David's cause was. He says, is there not a cause? Now jump down with me to verse 31. This conversation comes before King Saul. Notice with me, and when the, when the words were heard, which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. My friend, in all of the armies, and all of the battle, and all the warriors, there was not one man that was willing to fight this Goliath. But all of a sudden, they heard word that there was a young guy. There was this new guy. Nobody knows him, and nobody knows his name. But all of a sudden, he's like, I'll take him on. I'll win the battle. I'll fight for God. In verse 32, and David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail him, fail because of him. 
thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. Notice, for thou art but a youth. In biblical terms, a youth is a teenager. He was a young teenager, not even as old as Evan, hadn't even graduated high school yet. Now notice with me, the, the Goliath. And he, a man of war from his youth. Goliath was in his prime, probably is in his late 20s, early 30s, maybe even into his 40s. An undefeated champion who'd been trained in the art of war from the time he was a teenager. This man was a living, breathing, killing machine, undefeated on the battlefield. But notice with me God's preparation for the giant slayer. Look at verse 34. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. Remember that divine detour out into obscurity? Remember that time where it seems like he was set aside and given a lesser calling? It's because God was preparing him. Thy servant kept thy father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear. By the way, the thing you want to write in your notes is David the lion slayer. David the lion slayer. Thy servant kept thy father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And he rose against me. And I caught him by the beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing hath defied the armies of the living God. Notice with me in verse 37, David's faith. David said, moreover, the Lord. Notice with me that, that say, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion. David said, listen, hey, king. he didn't say, king, listen, I'm your man. I got the skills, I got the goods, I got the strength, I got the smarts, I got the swiftness, I got the ability, I got the... He said, no, it wasn't me, king, it was God. That's why God will put you through trials. That's why God will turn the heat up on you. That's why God will allow you to face bigger things than you can face because you're going to find out, my friend, that there is a God in heaven who can do things that you can't do. The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Now our last section tonight is the challenge is answered. The challenge is answered. This challenge the uh, Philistine had been giving for 40 days. Notice here, there is one, two, three, four, five, six things I want to give to you very briefly tonight. We'll be done. Number one, the unproven armor. The unproven armor. Let me teach you a great truth, my friend, about why you ought to get in your Bible, why you ought to walk with God, why you ought to come to church, why you ought to share your faith, why you ought to be on the front lines for Jesus. Notice with me in verse 38. And Saul armed David with his armor. King Saul had, 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 had breastplates of armor, and he had greaves, and he had helmets, and he had swords, and he had everything. Now listen. And he put on the helmet of brass upon his head and armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon, uh, upon his armor. And he essayed to go, or he tried to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. Do you know why most Christians step back from the battle? They're not battle ready. Do you know why most Christians will never volunteer or get on the front lines of service with Jesus? They're not proven. You see, they've never stepped up in faith and found out that God is faithful. They've never been comfortable. They've never taken the Word of God and become comfortable with using the Word of God. They've never become skillful with using the Word of God. My friend, it takes time. It takes, in, it, it takes determination. It takes a desire to say, listen, I'm going to learn what's in that Bible. I'm going to read that. I'm going to spend time every day reading that Bible. Number two, I, I'm going to get to know God. I'm going to have a real prayer life. And listen, I'm going to connect to God so that, listen, get to know God while you don't need Him because there's going to come a day where you do need Him. You're going to face a, a giant that's bigger than you, something you can't carry, something that you don't know how to go around. And listen, my friend, you better have a real relationship with God. You see, most people don't know God well enough to trust Him. Most folks have never stepped into the front line of battle. Most folks have never gone out, stepped on on faith, and, and, and tried to be a, a witness for Jesus or do something great for God. Listen, but this young man, 
This young man, listen, he took time. He did what he had to do. He did what he could do. And he found that God was faithful. Can I just challenge you, my friend? Prove God. Put him to the test. Learn to trust God. Learn to walk with God. Learn what's in your Bible. Learn how to use your Bible. Learn how to pray. Learn how to share your faith. Learn how to serve God. Get yourself prepared for the battle because a bigger battle is coming. Notice with me the shepherd's stones in verse 40. And he took off, and the Bible says, and he took all that off in 39. And he took his staff in his hand. And chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a script, that means a small bag, and his sling that was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Now let me give you the last blanks, and then we're going to read through the story. We see the next thing that happens is the giant's taunts, his taunting of David. Then we see David's deliverer in verses 45 and through verse 47. And then we see Goliath's defeat in verses 48 to verse 51. And then we see the victory of Israel. Notice with me as we pick up the reading in verse 41. And the Philistine came on and drew unto David. And the man that bare his shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Notice with me the pause, that which is unwritten. And the Philistine said to David, come to me. Do you know there are things that were said on this battlefield that God felt so, thought so in, insignificant, he did not record them. The cursing of uh, a Goliath by his God was so profane and so, can I say, so unnecessary that God did not record it from the divine record. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give thy flesh to the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. This is the giant's taunts. Notice with me in verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of the host, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee. And I will give the, car- uh, give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Listen to me, David wasn't fighting for his glory. David wasn't fighting for Saul. David wasn't fighting for money. David wasn't fighting for a wife. David was fighting for the glory of God. My friend, listen to me. Where are the champions in this day? Where are the men and women? Where are the young men? Where are the young ladies? Where are the older men? The older ladies will get a passion for God. You know what ticked David off the most? David was frosted that no one loved God. No one revered God. No one desired God's name to be upheld and glorified. No one would step out and say, I'll fight for, I'll stand for God. My friend, we live in a day where they're trying to push God off the face of the earth. They're trying to scrub out his name and his history. They're trying to scrub out the Bible. My friend, where are the Christians who will stand up and say, there is a living God who has spoken, my friends, and there is a God in heaven, and you will not defy him. Where are the men and women that will be a champion for God? The Bible says in verse 48, and when they came to pass, when the Philistine arose, he was sitting down this whole time and came and drew nigh to meet David that David hasted. And ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it. History records that a shepherd would often use a, just a simple two pieces of leather, a small pouch, and a stone. Many times they could hurl that stone with military precision. Some say that they, that projectile could exceed 150 miles an hour. And there are records in the Bible that at 50 paces men could hit a hair. They were good. But my friend, this was a supernatural fight. And the Bible says here, and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead, and the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran And stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof. And slew him and cut off his head therewith. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. The Bible concludes saying that the Israel went 
and concluded the battle and won a great victory that day. Do you know why they won a great victory that day? Because there was one young man who believed God could. One young man who made a difference. My friend, do you know that all of history many times turns on one man, one woman, one person, young or old, who will simply believe that God can and has the faith to trust Him to do it? Let's pray. Father, we just thank You for this evening. We thank You, Father, for this wonderful, inspiring, challenging passage of biblical history. I know that many deride it, and they say it glorifies violence. No, it glorifies God. The very reality that we live in a world cursed by sin, that there is truly evil in this world, and that evil in all its forms need to be identified, and it needs to be stopped. Oh God, that there would be a heart in your people who we'll say, Lord, I'm, I'm nothing. I'm like David. Lord, I'm, I'm despised. No one sees any value or great potential in me. But God, you see what we can be with you. And Lord, I just thank you for that. God, thank you for being in the life-changing business. Thank you, Lord, you can take a delivery boy and God make a conquering champion out of him. Father, I thank you, Lord, for one young man, Lord, one teenager who knew God and walked with God and saw God do great things and believed that God could still do great things. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray that we would be challenged. Oh, Lord, what a shame it is. And those of us, Lord, who are got a little older, and we've seen our prayers answered, and we've seen you move, and we've seen you provide, and we've seen you bless, God, that it Lord, it took a teenager. Where were the men? Where were the older ones? Where were the ones who should have seen and known God? Lord, thank you for the young people that love you and are passionate about you. God, I pray you'd raise up a generation of young people, Lord, that are on fire for Jesus Christ here at Rose Park Baptist Church. And God, I pray, dear Lord, it would shame all of us older folks that have gotten comfortable Lord, I pray and ask, oh God, that you'd please help us, Lord, to understand, Lord, there are giants in this world, and somebody has to stand up and believe God can do something that's impossible. Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight, in Jesus' name, and amen. We'll stand.